you don't solve problems by by just reducing them to simpler sets of simpler problems. And if you want to have complex problems, you've got to study them in, in complex ways. You know, there, there are people who make generators and people who make pistons for cars, but there's got to be somebody who makes a car. What is behavior? It's a question that can't really be answered from the vantage point of any one discipline. That's why we have the behavioral sciences. Uh, parts of evolutionary biology, economics, political science, anthropology, sociology, all work together, or at least are supposed to work together, to try to answer that question. But if you've been around those disciplines, you, you probably know that it's not that simple. They all have their different languages, methods, departments that are often siloed off really heavily and don't really have a connection between them. Herbert Gintis is an economist and a behavioral scientist who spent his life trying to integrate these approaches together. He's made very important contributions throughout all of these disciplines, evolutionary, biology, game theory, economics, uh, sociology, anthropology, political science. He's published in big journals for all of those disciplines. And the ideas that he's put forward, some of which we talk about here, the rational actor model in economics, how to think about norms, emerging politics and the game theoretic considerations that might go into thinking about how norms emerge and more are ideas that go a long way in trying to integrate these fields together. Here is my conversation with Herbert Gintis. How bad is the disunity amongst the behavioral sciences as you see it? The basis of uh, their work is, for instance, in biology is uh, fitness maximization. And in economics, it's utility maximization, which is a long story we can go into if you'd like. But they're basically the same thing. There's an, there's an objective function, and you, an individual behavior is determined by maxima, individuals maximizing that fitness function or utility function. And there are fields like psychology, say human psychology in particular, where they totally reject that model and anthropology where they never even heard of that model. So, uh, and, and uh, th th this unity is very serious because um, really you should be asking questions and looking around where the answers are found. You shouldn't be disciplinarily uh, isolated and say, well, I do economics, so I have to do this. And if, you, and if sociologists totally disagree with me, which they do, Sociologists totally reject, almost completely, not everyone. I don't want to overstate it. But when you learn as a graduate student what sociology is, I, I went through nine textbooks in graduate sociology one year, and all of them deal with the rational actor model, which is central to economics bi biology. Uh, all of them uh, put it in the 16th chapter and say it's not true. In fact, one of my favorite statements, I heard a psychologist give a talk and he said, people aren't logical, they're psychological. And I thought, well, really? That's why, we're the, that's why we've done so well as a species, haven't we? Because we're so uh, non-logical. <laughs> you know, it's very serious and it's, it's caused by, I think, the fact that the way, the way universities develop over time. They developed by separating what was called in like the 17th century, maybe I'm not a historian, I don't know, called you know, uh, philosophy. And, every, and if you study philosophy, it means you study Aristotle, who was a great physicist, as a matter of fact. I mean, he made, made, made major mistakes, but he, his work lasted for you know, 1,700 years or more, I'm sure. Again, I'm not a historian. So uh, what happens is, that uh, the university, whenever it has a new bunch of people with doing different stuff, they put them in a different category. Okay, now we're gonna have economics and philosophy, and we're going to have natural philosophy turn into biology and zoology and the, and the like, and put the people together and let them talk to each other and let them start journals and, um, publish stuff and hire good people and good people are people who pu publish in the good journals, but don't use the same journals, use different ones. So you can isolate yourself. So for a period of a hundred years from say 1850, 
to or not, I think, uh, 100 from 1850 to the present, um, the university system developed as a system of, of feudal hierarchies, each one uh, unbeholden to any others. So if you publish an article in, in Nature, for instance, and you're an economist, well, that's not economics. What are you doing there with nature? Is it? So uh, it's very serious. And, and we know that it's uh, not the right way to go. And uh, as you may imagine, it's why I'm here. I've spent a the last at least 20 years or 25 working on how you make behavioral science a science, meaning a system in which there are fundamentals and there are sideshows and there are uh, specialty fields, but they all fit together. So when two fields inter interact, when they intersect and when they study the same thing, they don't disagree with each other. They can have massively different things to say about other things that they don't both address. Um, address. But when they agree, they should, and when they overlap, they should agree. For instance, biologists never say chemistry is junk. We don't do chemistry. We do crystal chemistry. But economists say, well, sociology is junk. We don't do sociology. We do economics, which means we, for a long time, by the way, well, we can go through this. For a long time, what that meant was that we assume people are selfish. In fact, it, I don't know how many years it took us to work out that being selfish is not the same as being rational. Now, it's obvious once you see it. For instance, if I'm selfish, then I care about what I eat for dinner. But it's not irrational to think about, to care about what other people eat for dinner. If I give money to a charity because they give money to the help uh, feed the poor or to get people out of poverty, that's not being irrational at all. In fact, if, so, so it, took, it just took very long. Whereas in sociology, they totally identify um, uh, rationality with, with self-interest. And of course, again, this is a long story, but over the past 20 years, we have, determine quite confidently that human beings are altruistic in an exceptional number of ways. It's exceptional. It's not like a little piece of us. It's a big piece of us. And by the way, altruistic doesn't mean you're a nice guy. It just means you do things that benefit others. You do things that hurt others. If you do things that hurt you and hurt others, that's altruistic in a sense. For instance, uh, my father-in-law told me one. He came up, my in-laws came up and said, well, Flora got mugged in the supermarket. And uh, luckily they caught the perpetrator and put her on trial. And we kept her the trial every day to make sure she was convicted. And I said, well, what do you care whether she's convicted or not? Is she going to come steal another wallet from you? Why, why would you do it? waste your time? You know, and excuse me, but this is a small story, but you can multiply it by infinity. <laughs> and there's no answer. The thing is, it's like common sense. Obviously, you want to hurt somebody who hurts you, but that's not. You know, so we've learned that people are out even negatively altruistic. People love to hurt people who hurt them. So all of this is revolutionized these fields as long as they're not uh, cordoned off from the general discussion. And, and a lot of it is cordoned off. So it's a slow process. Right. I mean, any students who go through this in practice really know this well, right? Like if you're an ec economist and you have sociological questions, you're told to go to the sociological, sociology department. And when you get there, it turns out they're speaking a totally different language than economics. So you have no way to link the two things together. Well, that's the problem. You see, when you say you should, well, in the old days, and I say the old days because I'm an old man now, but when I was a graduate student and a young PhD, uh, people talked about, uh, people talked about uh, cooperation among the di disciplines. Now, the cooperation was called, um, uh, 
Well, no, I don't remember any. But what, what we have decided in the past 30 years is it's not that the disciplines say different things, but they all fit together nicely, you know, like a, a, a picture with, a, you know, six parts. And if you look at all six, they're all different, but they fit together into a beautiful picture. It's not that at all. It's that they look at the same thing and say completely different things about them. Completely different things. So you can't say, let's get together and, and have um, uh, inter, oh, here it is, interdisciplinary, it's called. We should get people together and have an interdisciplinary unity of them. But what we call it now is transdisciplinary. It's not interdisciplinary because if, if the people come together, they don't agree with each other. They talk different languages. It's crazy. And some of them are infinitely crazy. For instance, how can you have anthropology as, the, as a field and have sociology as a field? What's the difference? What? Because you, you, you go to some uh, small scale society, it's still not human society. Now, if you look at the literatures of these two fields, they don't overlap. Margaret Mead, sociologists don't read Margaret Mead. Um, Talcott Parsons, well, nobody can read Talcott Parsons, but if you try, you're a sociologist. You're, you're not an anthropologist. Why, how did that happen? Well, some people that I gave the history, I mean, short history of it before, it just evolved that stupid way. So you can't just unite the various behavioral sciences. Each one of them I have found, each one of them has something really important to say, but also has other things that were wrong. I've never found a discipline which I can say is right in some sense. The, the core theory is something I would accept as being provisionally right. Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, they disagree on fundamental issues, and you have to reform and re I mean, reform in the sense of reformulate almost all of the behavioral disciplines. Um, I, I might accept political science because political scientists don't really have, they really borrow from the other sciences. Uh, and, and the most cogent political science is probably more descriptive. Uh, than uh, theoretical. Political science, for whatever reason, has does seem like it's a lot more mature than the other fields, maybe barring economics. Well, you know, the, fu the fundamental, th the funny thing about political science is that it's, it, it does, there's very good work in this area, and I have no problem calling it science, and I don't really have any basic critique with critical, critical sciences. It doesn't have any basic tenets, which I think are incompatible, except one. It does not understand the notion of rational choice the way that economists do. Here's what it is. Suppose that, uh, why should I vote? Well, because I want one candidate to win. Well, why do you care which candidate wins? Well, it will affect my life and it will affect other people's lives. So I'm both self-interested in and other regarding, I want this fellow to win. Oh, really? Well, uh, can your vote change the outcome? No. In fact, I looked it up, I mean, it was not too hard. In, there's never in history has there been an election with more than 40,000 uh, voters in which one person made a difference. In, in the English speaking countries, England, uh, United States, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. But so you ask somebody, you, you want someone to win because it might affect your life, but you agree that it wouldn't matter whether you voted or not because you're not gonna change the outcome of the election. The probability you're gonna change it is less than the probability that it's a supernova in Alpha Centauri. So what are you doing it for? Well, if everybody thought that way, then uh, we couldn't have democracy, but nobody would vote. And you say, well, yeah, it's true, but that doesn't explain why you vote. Because if, if you don't vote, everybody else is still gonna vote. Who votes? So the whole idea of, and, and by the way, this is called non-consequential behavior. Consequential behavior is 
behavior that, that changes outcomes. Non-consequential is behavior that changes, doesn't change outcomes, but it has other, has other uh, ramifications. For instance, I feel good when I vote. I feel like the right person. I think it's a good thing to do. I do take the moral imperative, um, Kantian imperative, which is do the way you think everybody should do. So, but, but that's not rational. So we have to def re actually redefine the notion of rationality from uh, to a, 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 what I would call a social rationality. Yeah, so I've always thought of the rational actor model in economics as a, the, the controversies around it, the criticism around it might stem from the fact that it's mathematically robust. It's a formalism that's robust that helps us make predictions that are statistically, that are statistically valid to, to a certain degree. But it's missing a conceptual element that I think people, at least the valid criticisms that people have of the rational actor model are not in the way of criticizing the formalism, but criticizing the fact that it's not rationality that's being described by the model, it's something else. Or at least not rationality as we refer to it in common language. Of course, I can't disagree with that, but that's not why people, that's not why sociologists have uh, rejected the social, rational actor model. That's not why they've done it. It's not because uh, some because uh, it, it's not because the rational actor model has a weakness that they can describe that makes it useless or worth throwing out. I don't think the rational actor model is complete. I think that it is incomplete, but I've never seen a proper critique of it except the one I just gave you. I know that may sound arrogant, but it seems true to me. Oh, no, it's a, there are two. One is the first problem with the rational actor model as done in economics. It's not that people are, are, are altruistic. That fits perfectly with altruism. I mean, if I like to watch you eat green hamburgers and I, uh, I like to watch you do it, I don't have to do it. I watch you do it. So there's not, altruism is no problem for rationality. It's totally rational for comedy. But the, the two problems, one is that a lot of action is non-consequential. Or I would call, you might even only want to call it content. Meaning you, people do what they do because they think it's the right thing to do. And they think it's the right thing for everybody to do or everybody of a certain category to do. Even if it's non-consequential, even if it does, you can say, oh yeah, I'm here. I don't expect to change the election. If I voted the other way on the election, it would come out the same. I don't read the newspaper about politics because they think it'll help me change the election. I read things in politics because I'm part of a social body or a Kantian collective that reads about and studies and communicates politics and then turns it into action at the voting booth or wherever, or the street or wherever. So that's the first crit real critique of rational actor model that I have. What it is that you, you must have a good theory of non-consequential behavior. Uh, and and that must be part of a, a social uh, rationality. Uh, the second is, is a little, it's quite different, but incredibly relevant. It's, it's a shame that I thought, thought of this so long ago before we see it in the streets, which is people do not have, in the rational actor model, people have what are called subjective priors. My subjective prior is what I tend to believe when I go into the next round of social interactions. Those are my priors. And then I update those priors by seeing actually what happens and saying, well, that was a little wrong. That was pretty good. And I'm going to increase the probability that I, that I believe in X and decrease it that I believe in Y. So um, that's called the subjective prior. It's the base of uh, the rational actor model from which one evolves through Bayesian updating and uh, experience. Problem is people, I, some people probably do have subjective priors and that's what guides their behavior. But the way I, I think much more social behavior can be described as people having uh, connected priors, that is, I believe mostly what I believe other people that I interact with believe. So I don't have my own prior. I have a network of, 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 uh, of interacting minds 
that together create a prior of a social right. category. Social rationality, so, or what you call social, social rationality. Social, you're right. So when someone says, I am absolutely sure that the election was stolen by, uh, from Trump, what they mean is that everybody I come to, I talk to, they will say it's stolen. Well, who am I? Come on, it's stolen. So you become very uh, overly um, uh, wedded to a particular view because it's part of a distributed network of minds. And uh, that's a hard concept to actually do mathematically, but it, it's quite true. So those are the, my two uh, critiques of the rational actor model. And they're not, uh, they're, they don't sit deep six it, it just creates a new framework for our doing you know, behavioral science. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what I was trying to get at do you, is that, do you think there's just a communication problem on the part of economics that calling it the rational actor model leads to a ton of confusion amongst disciplines who are not read well read in economics problem it's always a problem always a problem. Right? The problem here is go try to change it yeah i did i did i spent several years saying i'm not going to use the word rational actor i'm going to call it the beliefs and preferences model and um, the bpm but it didn't stick I mean, I tried it, and the people, what's this? You know, what's this? What's that? You're making up words. You can't go making up words. And it's like in biology. You know, in biology, if you say something is hereditary, it doesn't mean at all what it means in common sense, day, daily life. How many? What's the what's the, how, how her, what's the heredity of two having two eyes? Is it environmental or genetic? Oh, because it's two eyes, it's genetic. No, it's completely. Everyone's born with two eyes. If you have one eye, then you had an accident, which is environmental. So the, her, the heredity coefficient of having two eyes is zero, not one. People don't understand heredity at all. And then they fight in over and over about, you know, what, what, about whether something is heritable, for instance, IQ. But they don't even know what, I, what heritability means. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but that's you can't change the word. What are they going to change it to? Kalaka. <laughs> so I don't think you can change it. Word rationality. When you when you have to say what it means exactly. Every book I've written on the subject, I have a, a long section on what is in it and what is not in it according to behavioral science. But of course, it's not going to agree with people. Someone said, "Well, if you eat soft boiled eggs, you're irrational because they really are awful." <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh. I've often found that people who try to unify the disciplines are either too weak or too strong sometimes. Like, they're too weak in the sense of what you talked about earlier, where it's not really interdisciplinary. Too weak in the sense that it's not really interdisciplinary. It's just kind of playing lip service to each other's discipline. Or it's too strong where people just want to get rid of a principle, from, from get rid of the rationality model, get rid of something that's clearly working. Right. Right, that's right. If you work in, in a transdisciplinary environment, almost everything is up for grabs in almost all fields. But they're almost always some core principles are almost always um, validated by that behavior, and others are not. In economics, I mean, the rational actor model is validated, but it's not validated in the formula in your textbook. That's ridiculous. That's, it's not true at all. Social rationality, or just the idea of of distributed cognition in general, it's something that I think people have a tough time understanding, uh, or tough time understanding from the biological evolutionary uh, perspective. So, do you mind just elaborating that on that a little bit? It, it's 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 all over in, in small scale societies. In different ones that live, you know, two kilometers apart have very different beliefs. And uh, they believe them strongly, and people believe their religious beliefs very strongly. And you say, well, you know, why do you believe you should wear this piece of garment? Well, God says, uh, Muhammad says, and, uh, Jesus says, uh, Elijah says, yeah, well, you know, they're just guys. Why do you, <laughs> what's going on? Well, the answer is that that's how humans evolved. I mean, I, I as you probably know, I've spent a lot of time worrying about 
how you explain the evolution of human preferences. They don't just have them. They evolve because they have survival value. Um, and the, 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 the survival value of believing what everybody around you believes is that they're nice to you and uh, you can form a collective that's not nice to other people. Take their, take their resources, take their uh, women, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I think this is an evolved behavior and it's not only behold in humans, behold, it's, it's evolved in, in, in most animals, although it's really hard to talk about the beliefs of animals uh, other than their behavioral belief. They, they don't talk, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've heard you talk about how the development of weapons uh, almost necessarily implies that you can't have a alpha male driven society you need cooperation in order to go because as soon as you have weapons developed well nobody can be be the alpha anymore you need cooperative systems well they can i don't know that's a, a slight elaboration that's right that's right that's what i do believe yes um humans evolved developed weapons way back i mean six million years ago the weapons were projectile and not not apples and arrows but just stones uh, et cetera. And they use them very judiciously, uh, stones and bats. And humans evolved the ability, but there's, there's an interesting literature on this in, in physiology. Around the sides, your sides, the, 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 these muscles in your side, these are extremely well developed in humans um, for throwing. Chimpanzees. Don't have those muscles. They're not developed that way, and they can they can throw, but they can, it's very hard to hit anything. And they don't throw stones when they fight. They don't have any projectile missiles when they uh, when they uh, dispute. If the alpha male in a troop of chimpanzees, if you want to fight the alpha male, find him when he's asleep, knock him on the head, and wake him up, and then you fight. Well, humans they have these weapons. Find him when he's asleep, smash his head in, and you don't fight. He's dead. Now, this some people find this silly. You can't really believe these sophisticated cultural things about distributed cognition and, uh, and Kantian thought have something to do with smashing a guy on the head and killing him. But they do. That's the interesting thing about evolutionary biology. These, the instruments turn into the behavior. They change the behavior. So uh, detail in this, but at some point, um, weapons became developed enough so that the alpha male could not protect himself against being an onslaught in the middle of the night. One smash and you kill, you kill a guy. And by the way, they, it has also to do with gracility. That is, humans, humans had become more uh, less, more brittle and less um, robust uh, for reasons that I won't go into. So, um, yeah, so you can't have an alpha male that runs society anymore. So you have two choices, either disband society or else find an alternative decision-making mechanism. And that decision-making mechanism apparently was uh, uh, discussion and election of leaders, choice of leaders. And all, I, I would say almost all um, hunter-gatherer societies do this. It's, they're quite egalitarian. I mean, they're very violent often. I'm not trying to, you know, make some fairy tale story about them, but they, they, they do tend to be extremely egalitarian. They choose their leaders, and if someone wants to impose himself on them, they kill them, or they ostracize them, or they otherwise punish them. So yes, uh, the, the, the interesting thing about evolutionary biology is that you can find evo low culture, low um, moral situations, which explain the highest level of morality and complexity in that society. So for instance, yeah, you can hit the leader on the head and kill him. Therefore, you can't have a leader like that. That's very simple, okay? Now, by the way, another simple point that I've tried to make over the years is that, oh, more recently, I mean, 
in, in the past two, three centuries is the centrality of foot soldiers in war. Right, just today, read the newspaper, it's all about drones and helicopters and, uh, uh, and aircraft carriers. Who's winning the war? The foot soldiers are winning the war. Everybody else is clobbering them. That's been true for a hundred years. Why do foot soldiers uh, fight? They fight because they care about their country and they care about their people which is a moral issue. They don't fight because they get paid six shekels for every drop of blood or something. They fight because it's the right thing to do and they're willing to die for it. Put that in your economic self-interest thing. And, but another point, what is so good about a foot soldier? Well, the first thing you learn is the foot soldiers carry mobile weapons and they are lethal. You can even knock out a tank with a shoulder level weapon. But the next thing you learn is mitochondria. Humans, you feed them in the morning and they go out all day and fight. They have a battery called mitochondria, you know, an ATP and this and that, which make them incredibly capable of carrying their energy with them where they go. You can't do that with a drone. The drone you can send somewhere, it's got a battery. The bigger the battery, the shorter the range, and you know, you've got all these problems. As soon as you can find me a robot that has a good battery, better than humans, um, you know, the, the nature of war will change dramatically, really dramatically, because, because foot soldier is the basis of democracy. Even Aristotle said that. If you're gonna engage your people in fighting some other people, you better give them something to fight for. And that's a, it's a, an identity as a, uh, as a people. You got to give it to them. And that's what happened over the period from the first to second world war. All these democratizations, you know, the, the, the military elites couldn't win wars. Uh, what do you think happened to us in, in, in Vietnam, in Iraq, right? We did really fine because the US soldiers are really, you know, they're very pro, or they're very patriotic. But the Iraqi soldiers weren't. The, the ISIS soldiers were. The ISIS soldiers were fighting for a thing they believed in. Now, I don't believe in it, but they did. The Iraqi soldiers got paid in a certain amount of money, and if you shot at them, they ran the other way. So my point is, you know, you have to combine all of these disciplines together to get a reasonable picture of a social situation. Because I just did economics, I did psychology, I did uh, you know evolution, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we've been doing for the past twenty years or so in trying to uh, unify the behavioral sciences. So I've heard you talk about the principle of gene cultural evolution that you defined as being the central principle that should be used in this kind of unification. Gene culture coevolution, yes. Again. When you look at, if you read the paper or read some, you know, read popular science, you know, it's for 100, 200, I don't know how long people have talked about nature versus nurture. And I remember because of when I was young um, and I started, and my friends were all radical leftists. And they, people like that don't like evolution. They didn't like, they, it almost it destroyed the Soviet Union. They had this fake guy, Lysenko, a biologist, saying that um, that uh, evolutionary theory was bourgeois, you know, and it ruined their crops for twelve years until Khrushchev was uh, overthrown or kicked out. But anyway, my friend and co-author Samuel Bowles, we said, well, no, evolution is where it's at. That's why humans have behaved the way they are, because they're a species like ducks. You know, oh no, we're above that. No, we're not like that. All the it was called what what did um uh it's called the uh empty brain, you know, like the lock uh, brain in a vat. The brain in a vat. No, not the brain in the vat. The um Oh, the tabula rasa? Uh, tabula rasa, yes. right. 
So you can read great books about the Pablo. Steven Pinker's book about the Pablo La Rosa is really quite excellent. You're born with a blank brain and then we fill it up with stuff. So, you know, bourgeois people are filled up with bourgeois stuff and we're gonna fill you up with working class stuff. And um, Sam Bowles and I, my co-author said, oh no, humans have certain pre pre predilections to behave in certain ways and to believe in certain ways, just like ducks. If we don't behave, we don't behave like ducks, we don't look like ducks. We have our own set of, yes, they are highly variable, much more variable than any other species because along with the genes that determine your behavior, your environment and your culture determines your behavior. Now, other animals do have culture, but most of it is, um, uh, most of it is built into the genome of the species. Chickens, for instance, the um, mating behavior of, of many animals, say birds. Well, birds have certain behavior. Different birds behave differently and they do different things when they mate. And, and they're, you can call them culture, but they're built in. But humans have a separate way of transmitting information across time called culture. And that is very, very important in determining individual behavior. For instance, the language, you can't even understand it. It's some language you don't know. Um, so culture becomes very important and that's nurture. So we call it gene culture co-evolution. Why do we call it co-evolution? What does co-evolution mean? It means genes affect culture and culture affects genes. How does culture affect genes? Well, you can talk, for instance. Why did language develop? That's a long story I'm not gonna go into. I've written about it in current anthropology. Um, it's a long story. But if you say, well, you know, why don't chimpanzees talk? The answer is, well, they're too stupid. They're dumb. No, they can't talk because they don't have the same muscles we have. They don't have the same uh, nerves that we have. They don't have the same mental uh, neur neuronal connections that we have at birth. And what these do is, what that means is that Here's a scenario. We have to have collective leadership. We have to elect our leaders. Who do we choose as a leader? Well, we get together at eight about fire and we talk. Well, if you can't talk, you don't participate in, in it at all. If you talk, if you can talk really well, then you might have some good ideas and other people say, let's elect him a leader. He talks really well, see if he carries it out. But you can't talk well without the right muscles. So people that, that just by mutation have a, a, a stronger set of muscles and nerves for audition, for creating sounds, they're going to have more children because their communities are going to elect them to, to, to positions of influence and they'll get the uh, healthy females and the healthy children. Think of any other possible way that you could explain why people talk and chimpanzees don't. I mean, and all you can still you can say God came down and struck some guy on the head with a wand and then he talked. But that's coevolution because the genes for talking, when they develop, they make it possible to have a more complex language with more sounds and more distinctions. And that more that complicated language then favors. Uh, people who have genes with the right muscles and the right tongue uh, apparatus and the thorax, et cetera. That is gene culture evolution. Okay, it means that we're, we're don't tell me how gen it's all genetics, it's not. Don't tell me it's all culture, it's ridiculous. It's a long sequence of 6 million years of gene culture co-evolution. And my friends who you know said, well, you, you're a bourgeois apologist because you believe genes matter. So, well, it's also true that genes matter. It helps. It certainly helps. It's simply not the case that the brains are uh, tabula rasa, as so correctly said it. So that's what gene culture rev uh, evolution is. Yeah, I mean, 
like it seems to me you have to take some specified cognitive structures uh, to do any kind of work in behavioral sciences, right? You have to assume that through gene culture evolution or through whatever processes, humans have these specialized cognitive structures and they exhibit X, Y, Z behavior. You have to take account of that. Yeah, that's right. Where, where does cognitive science fit into this picture? I don't know. I, I don't. Uh, I don't follow it very much. I think it's extremely primitive. I'm not trying to criticize it. I mean, the problems are very, very hard. Uh, I have not de depended on any particular take on uh, cognitive science, and uh, I'm not sure that. The cognitive, I don't know how it fits in. I must say, I don't know how it fits in. Uh, That's fair. Yeah. The, 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 the underlying problem is, I think, the, we behavioral scientists have a real problem, which is there are no single genes for behavior. Almost. No, notice, by the way, with all of the modern science and modern medicine, Behavioral modification is absolutely primitive. You can't take a, I, I once told my doctor, I, I said, doctor, can you give me some, um, uh, oh God. Okay, I don't need um, uh, birth control pills, but I could use some girth control pills. Can you give me some girth control pills? Because I want to lose weight. Nope. Oh, doctor, I'm, I'm afraid of cats. Can you give me a pill to make me not afraid of cats? No. Well, where in my brain am I afraid of cats? We don't know where in the brain is. There's no, the, the, the whole of genetic um, behavior, behavioral genetics, which is a big field, you know, that is how does our brain affect our behavior? They're lost when they come to individual genes. They don't know how. For instance, what are the genes for doing well in school? Well, there are 2,000 of them and they're separated or they're all over the brain. How do they fit together? We don't know. So the cognitive, the behavioral sciences, the behavioral genetics have not been, we know that it's true that our behavior is affected by our genetics. We don't know how it's true at all because we can't control right. it at all. The only thing, what, what can you control? Oh, people would love it if they had a real good, um, uh, what do you call it? Something makes you want to fall in yeah, love. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, something that could solve. Yeah, sure. You would give a pill like in the opera, the great opera. You give, give your lover a pill and he's definitely in love with you. No, we don't know any of that. So I have avoided, I, I've avoided cognitive science until it can say more about that. But I have not avoided. I think there's one thing that's really important, which is the nature of consciousness. That is not, I mean, it's, well, you, you probably know the literature on this is voluminous. One person I, I saw, Koi said, there's a huge literature on there going back 2000 years. None of it says anything of the least importance. Because we know nothing about it. Here's the problem. If you want to, okay, here's the problem with consciousness. It evolved. Now I take that as axiomatic. The opposite possibility is that God came down and put it in your head. But otherwise, it evolved. Because not only humans are are conscious. Chimpanzees are conscious. My dog is conscious. My cat is conscious. Are fish conscious? Probably a little bit. They. Why not? The only, the only only animal we know with some credibility is conscious is humans. Because you can say, yeah, I'm conscious. If I ask you, are you conscious? Say, yeah, I'm conscious. And I believe you because you're like me. You're born of woman and we're all the same. So we're, you're probably like me. But no important behavioral trait and capacity develops without it having some functional fitness properties. So it must be more fit to have it than not to have it. In other words, if all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of chimpanzees that have, they were just automatons, they were just zombies. They didn't have any consciousness, whatever. They just 
behave. They couldn't exist because otherwise they'd order to be here because there are people like that. And if they were more fit, they would reproduce more, but they don't. Conscious people reproduce more. But what is consciousness? Well, not only can't you answer that for a, as a question in cognitive science, you can't ask it in physics. If you, if you go to a physics department, you say, well, I'm working on the nature of consciousness. You say, well, why don't you get the fuck out of here? Yeah, the, there have been some attempts <laughs> in physics to reduce quantum mechanics to consciousness, but none of them have been successful, and none of them are in the mainstream. Uh, it's, it, uh, it's not successful, but it's amazing. Yes, to yeah, it, it is amazing. <laughs> like, people like von Neumann, the smartest person who probably ever lived, had this insane idea, right? And, and, and his Hungarian um, counterpart, Wigner, you know, I mean, he's more not well known, but he's right up there with the smartest people around. He said, he gave a lecture once and said, yes, consciousness is important in physics because that's what makes things really happen. You have to, have to observe it. You have to measure it. And it's not there until you measure it. And someone in the audience says, well, is that true of other species? It probably is, but uh, I think when you get down to the level of a mouse, um, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, I mean... Down to the level yeah, of I mean, mouse, it's, Like, you need to take account of conscious observation to do physics. That's certainly true, and nobody's disputing that. But... Well, nobody exactly, denies that. Obviously. To do physics, but not to be part exactly. of the physical world. Exactly. That's, that the there's, that's a totally different statement there's no problem with it, but if, uh, ontologically, it's a serious problem. So whenever you're talking about how brains interact with the rest of the world, you've got magn huge problems that have people have not even come around to solve. So I just boot. I just punt. I don't do them. I don't use the, Don't tell me. I, I'll never use the term consciousness to explain behavior. Say, oh, yeah, there was consciousness. Well, except in, of course, it's more senses of the word. When I'm asleep, I'm not conscious. Uh, if you knock me on the head, I'm, out, I'm in a coma, I'm not conscious. But the, the word in general as being self-aware and perceptive of the world, we don't know why that's true. Uh, and we, we have to punt on it. Yeah, that. I mean, as far as I can tell, um, cognitive science is, is moving forward without really dealing with a lot of the problems of consciousness. Not Not completely, but... They're able to study cognitively interesting phenomena without reaching consensus on what consciousness is. But you're right. It is very, very primitive. Well, yes, without reaching consensus. But if, if you do it right, I, I don't think people should even make claims about it. I mean, we just don't know. I mean, I listen to David Dennett, you know, and he says, well, consciousness is Dan illusion. Dennett. Yep. Dan Dennett, yeah. Didn't I say it? Consciousness is an illusion. Well, how do you know that? Well, blah, blah, blah. But well, that's just not plausible. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean consciousness is an illusion? Um, it's the only thing I know is what I'm conscious of. It's the only yeah. thing there is. How can it be? What's it an illusion of? You know, and then another one. Consciousness is just the brain doing its thing. Well, how do you know that? I mean, I have good friends and colleagues like it's SFIs. Sean Carroll, who's a brilliant expositor of podcasts, he believes things about quantum mechanics that I think are just ridiculous. Just ridiculous. I understand how you could entertain it, but how would you believe it? You know? So I think there are lots of spheres of activity where, you know, one of my books, maybe, you know, I did a book called um, Game Theory Evolving. And it was an exposition of game theory. Mostly it was oriented towards solving, solving problems. But I also did fundamental stuff about game theory. And the preface to it, the, 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 what you put in the, the, the quote at the beginning right. of the whole book, I don't know what they call that. Um, it was Wittgenstein who said, uh, that which one cannot say must, one must shut up about. Das was man kann nicht sagen, I said, well, that sounds right to me. I'll be quiet about things I don't know anything about. And if I'm not sure, I'll say, I'm not sure. 
Uh, and that's how we'll get more behavioral science uh, integration because people start saying, well, you know, uh, I don't know this. I was taught it in school, but I don't know it. I mean, you have to say that. I have to say that to myself every day. Sometimes I, I watch elementary quantum mechanics lectures because I have to say, I have to do it again and again and again and again. And I've noticed that my students, since I taught game theory for many years, people are taught stuff that's just wrong. And they're not taught to teach to, to, to think about it, just say it. So for instance, I asked my graduate class in quantum, in uh, game theory, advanced game theory, why do people play Nash equilibria in game? Oh, well, because there's, you can, there's no better choice for each person. Really? So that means that we should all play the Nash equilibrium. Oh, well, if you're rational, you should play the Nash equilibrium. So for instance, here's a game. It's called fingers. I put out one or two fingers. You put out one or two fingers. If they're both, if we agree, I win. If we disagree, you win. That's a simple game. And we know what the Nash equilibrium is. It's 50-50, put out one or two. Right. Nobody wins. I, 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 it's a fair game. So I say, well, if so, you're going to play the Nash equilibrium. Yes, I'm rational. Well, then it doesn't matter what I do. I can play all heads. Oh, one finger. I still win 50% of the time. You get that? It's very important. Right. Okay. If you play the Nash equilibrium, I don't have any reason to play right. the Nash equilibrium. Moreover, you know. If you're the same as me and you're the same information, you know that I have no re that if you're if, if I think you're going to play Nash, um, it doesn't matter what I do. So therefore, why should I play Nash? You're going to do what you want to do, and I don't care what you do. You know, if I, if I knew you were going to play all ones, I'd play all ones. But that's not what's happening. You're thinking that I'm going to distribute across, and therefore, it doesn't matter what you do. So neither of us have an incentive, has an incentive to play the Nash equilibrium strategy. Now, isn't that, I say that to my student and they say, we're gonna report you to the Dean. We're gonna cancel you. <sighs> no, I'm kidding. But they, it's very upsetting for people. And if you look at the literature, by the way, being transdisciplinary does not mean that you're superficial. It doesn't mean you read the pop literature on the subject. Oh, you can. It means you lead the deep literature on the subject because that's where the problem is going to lie. So in this case, if you, if you actually look at the literature on what are the pre, what are a set of sufficient conditions for playing in Nash equilibrium, there are several fine papers on it. Um, I won't go through them, but all of them, they're very complicated conditions. It is not true the people in a one-shot game will play an Nash equilibrium under uh, mostly, mostly one shot. Of course, if it's a prisoner's dilemma, they will. They won't even there because they have altruism. Um, but um, so then the question is, why is Nash so important? You're the one who's defending game theory. And I say, well, here's why Nash is important. If you play a game repeatedly in a social situation and you update using a rule which says people who do better or more successful have copies of themselves, the more copies of themselves, then the only dynamic equilibrium of that, the only evolutionary equilibrium is Nash. That's why Nash is important. Nash is important because all evolutionary equilibria are Nash. And almost no other equilibrium or not. So you have to study um, uh, evolutionary theory or, or evolutionary game theory, which is not biology, it's just math. You have to study evolutionary game theory to find out why, um, why Nash equilibrium is important. But my, my basic statement was that you have to read the deep literature. You can't just read, you have to read the journals in order to do this uh, synthesis. You can't just look at the pop stuff that's around. Yeah, it's a it's a tricky balancing act because on one hand you do need to do that, but on the other hand, uh, there's a ton of advantage in specializing. 
Like there's a reason that we've academia has blown up so far. If you get, put people in rooms and make them work on special problems, they can sometimes get further ahead. Um, and balancing those two is, is, is difficult. Sure. No, I totally agree. I'm not arguing against the specialization. I mean, huh, I specialize. I've started things I know, you know, 10 times better than others. And if I open up the American Economic Review, I don't understand nine out of 10 articles in that. Of course, you know, somebody is studying, you know, size of television sets in Iran. Well, you're better special. I, I'm nothing against specialization, but I do have something against the philosophy of, um, of uh, reductionism. I don't think that, uh, especially, you don't solve problems by, by just reducing them to simpler sets of simpler problems. And if you want to have complex problems, you've got to study them in, in complex ways. So, um, you know, of course, people are going to study. In fact, if I look around at my colleagues, wherever I've been, most of them are really good at reducing things to smaller things and then solving them with incredibly complex mathematical this is and that's and tables and charts. And that's fantastic, but it's not the whole story. You know, there, there are people who make generators and people who make pistons for cars, but there's got to be somebody who makes a car. Right. Who figures out the, the, the larger concepts that underlie them all. And also their similitudes and differences. Where is, what, what behavior in sociology, for instance, one of my principles, and I did a, a piece called Five Principles for the Unification of Behavioral Sciences. One of them was, uh, I can hardly remember now, but one of them I think was called uh, uh, the social construction of norms or something like that. The socio-psychological okay. theory of norms. Yes. yes. Could anything be more important for understanding human society? I can't think of a thing. When I learned that, and I learned it you know, a long time ago, oh, this is so important, I'll ask my economics teacher about it. Norm? Go to the sociologist. That's what she said a long you know, earlier in our talk. Norm, go to a sociologist. Yeah. But the thing that's happened is in the past 20 years, game theory and the rational actor model and behavioral economics or behavioral game theory have made it quite obvious that uh, the social norms uh, affect how people behave. There's a fundamental force. They're not universal and we don't understand a lot about them. I'm sorry, I just not say. There's a lot we do not understand about that, especially when they're conflictual social norms. In fact, I decided unhappily a couple of years ago that what were, my last book was called Individuality and uh, uh, Entanglement. I was already studying physics at that point, it's entanglement. And I figured out that, um, now I can't remember what I figured out. Oh yes. That what I did in, in that book, I presented general equilibrium models of economics and sociology. And when I was doing the sociology, I noticed that I can do it in for, formally, but I can't put any content in it. It's just a bunch of fucking bunch of equations. And I thought, well, you know, the fact is, we've learned a lot about equilibrium in behavioral theory, but we haven't learned a lot about dynamics. You, you can't predict any, I once got in a big fight with this guy, with, with a guy who said, oh, statistics is stupid because we can't predict anything anyway. Look, who predicted Putin would invade the, you know, Ukraine, he said. And I got really angry at that. I said, well, that's just, you, you shouldn't be telling people that. What do you mean, medical researchers shouldn't use statistics when they test drugs? You shouldn't use cross-sectional um, econometrics when you want to understand inequality. Give me a break. But what I should have said is, you, all the math in the world is not going to give you the dynamics of human society. We just do not have it. We do not know why. 20 years ago, 
if someone said to me, oh yeah, well, in 20 years, you'll have uh, you know, gay marriage and uh, you know, people will get fired for criticizing uh, lesbians. So, well, what planet do you come from? I mean, this is outrageous. No, it's true. We don't know. And I had a big fight with Talcott Parsons about that, actually. I never met Talcott Parsons. I was very young when he was very right. old. And he was not right down the street. And I actually taught in the sociology department when I was a, a graduate student and uh, when I was teaching, when I was assistant professor at Harvard. But I never met him. But he took, I, I dedicated my PhD dissertation to Karl Marx and um, talk to Parsons. And Parsons got all sorts of flack, evidently, for this radical SDS. I was fired from Harvard for the uh, 69 strike. I, I was not right. I, I, I shouldn't have been, and I was reinstated. I, I, mean, I shouldn't have been in the sense that I did not really take part in the, in the uh, occupation of uh, in whatever that hall was called. But at any rate, he, he, got, he was so upset, he wrote a whole long article in, in the leading economic journal, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, criticizing my paper in that journal. I, I was ecstatic here, I'm 22 years old. And this guy is rapping on me, you know, this is fantastic. So I got to write a reply. And in the reply, I said, look, you say, People do what they do because they have certain norms and values and they carry them out. Who carried them out when the women took off their bras and went around saying women's liberation? Who did it when they sat in the back of the bus, black person sitting in the back of the bus and saying, I'm not gonna take this anymore. Who did it when we go out in the streets for Vietnam, blah, blah, blah. Where is all this uh, normative unity? And um, I actually, about 10 years ago, I went through my article and, quarterly journal and his response his response was completely i thought he might be right about those things i changed my mind no nope, he wasn't everything he said was wrong but still that was my view so at, the, at that point my view was well you know you need a much more dynamic theory than the social norms right, right. It, what you did that that was the biggest profound insight that I found reading your work is that you can predict the, you can predict the dynamics of a system. You can predict the equilibriums that might emerge, but you can't predict how they're going to change. Human behavior is just far, far, far too complex and far too little is known. Right. right. But, you know, I don't want to go too far with that. I, I suspect there's, if there weren't technological change, you'd do a lot better. Technological change changes the rules all the time. It's like, it's like, uh, um, it's like trying to change the um, German Enigma machine during World War II when they're changing the machine every day. Well, you can't do it. And that's our problem. You know, you can't. We don't have enough stability in society to talk about the way you move to equilibrium because the equilibrium is always changing. When I studied, when I, when I learned anthropology and I read a whole bunch of stuff about simple societies, hunter-gatherers mostly, they have a lot in common. If they use a certain technology, they do tend to be a certain way. And perhaps there was an equilibrium process getting them that way, but we never know because all our societies are evolving. And so they're getting contaminated. And, um, I suspect we'll never have really good dynamics for human behavior, but who knows? Sociology, um, and sociology to a lot of people, I think, is the is the most mysterious part. Is that sociology at least seems like it's lacking a central theory? I pretend to lack the theory to have a theory. It's more like history in that regard. It's like we have what what we teach you is how to do it. We teach you how to do it, and then you go find out what you find out when you do it. You know, that's what it's starting. This is a historical method and keeping notes, you know, and all that stuff. Yeah, anthropology is a lot like that. It's not, um, but also as modern anthropology has turned into a uh, morality play, uh, mostly, not completely. There's a lot of wonderful, great, but 
departments are generally the, the top departments are all these postmodern departments that don't believe in science. You know, they they don't like the work that we do. They hate the work that we do because uh, it's we we go to small scale societies and we try to observe how people behave in these societies. We give them scenarios called games, you know, and they play them and they win money or they win cigarettes or whatever they happen to like. And, and the anthropologists don't want to do that. They want to preserve the simple societies. That's what the goal is. The goal is to preserve them against modernization, against modernism, protect their cultures. Well, uh, that's like medicine versus, uh, you know, microbiology. Medicine is about saving people. That's fine if that's what you want to do. I don't really care. I mean, if I think about it, my grandparents, you know, picked rutabagas in Central Europe. And I'm glad that I don't. <laughs> I don't want to be like them. I love them. I'm not them. But they are fine. But that's not science. So they go in and criticize science. So, for instance, the major book in anthropology. It's not in anthropology, it used anthropology, it was called um, 15 Small Scale Societies. And my press was Princeton. And I published more than once there. And I'm not, in fact, I could say it's the only place I published except MIT, basically. And um, they wouldn't, the anthropologists wouldn't accept the manuscript because they, they, they were, uh, it wasn't uh, postmodern. So, so I just want to say that, but sociology has another problem. The problem is they're all a bunch of bleeding heart leftists. Now, of course, I was myself a bleeding heart leftist, or at least I was a Marxist. I, you know, got arrested for doing this or that. That was during the Vietnam War. Uh, that was during the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War times, yes. It was anti-war, anti-war stuff, and race stuff, and even... Even then, gender stuff was was there. It was all there. But the whole the profession became a way of expressing liberal ideology, and it still is. Uh, I I joined the ASA for several years, but I felt like I was an SDS again. SDS being the group that fought against the Vietnam War. They're just too political, and they're not theoretical at all. They just talk. So at any rate, I'm very critical of them. I'm less critical of econ economics, as a matter of fact, because economics has been open to new ideas and it's been taking them in. Now, if you have a student listening and say, well, not my professor hasn't gotten any new ideas. <laughs> well, I understand that it has certainly not trickled down. But let me say this. There are, there's more than one initiative, but I'll describe one. It's called CORE, C-O-R-E. And there's a whole group of people, including my co-author, Sam Bowles, who have developed this, uh, and you'll look it up on the web. It's quite powerful. And it has a chance of taking over the economics uh, 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 undergraduate courses. It's not left, it's not right, it's not center, it's economics, it's facts, and how the world appears to work. So, and this is happening in biology too now, but I won't go through that now. But at any rate, lots of stuff happening. So a great period to, to be working. Yeah, I mean, behavioral economics has come a long way in a very short time. Could I, could I express to you how amazing that flight has been? A trip to the moon on the cosmic wings. Just one of those things. One day I went into my, I had a student, wasn't a student, he was, a follower of Sam Bowles and me. We were all young. He was 10 years younger. His name is Ernst Fair, Austrian working in, uh, I'm sorry, I forget. He works in, uh, not Vienna, yeah. At any rate, he comes up to me in uh, American Economic Review end of the year meetings in uh, no, I forget what city. I think it was New York City. And I said, I were both very, very busy. And I said, Ernst, what are you working on? He said, fairness. I said, oh, that's wonderful. But I thought to myself, oh, that's bullshit. It's not going to happen. Fair is bullshit. It's not Marxist. 
And about two months later, I got this paper on my desk at the University of Massachusetts where I was there. And it was this paper on fairness. And I read it and my whole life changed immediately. I said, this is incredible. He did this experiment. This, this is the experiment, it's very famous actually. He, he sets people up in game theoretic contexts. And he, he says, okay, one subgroup we are gonna be employers and another subgroup we are gonna be employees, workers. And what you're gonna do is the employer can offer a wage to the worker for doing a certain task. And if the worker accepts that wage, he, he, he has to promise to do the task. And then uh, the task, if it's done properly, pays off for the employer, but it's costly. So the worker has an incentive for not doing the thing you promised to do. So you say, you're giving me $10 wage, fine. I'll give you 20 units of widgets output. That's worth $15. Okay, how much does it cost you to produce the 15 widgets? $5. So I come out with it $5, I'm making money. But if I'm honest, I'll do what I'll do. And if the employer thinks he's honest, he'll give me a big wage. If he gives me a little wage, I'll say, well, I don't know whose widgets for you. I'll give me $2, I'll give you a widget. I'll tell you, I'm going to give you 15 widgets. I don't only give you one widget. So how does this work in reality? Well, in reality, employers immediately, the first time they play the game, the employers that um, offer high wages get high returns from the workers. The workers who say, I'll give you 15 widgets, they, they cheat, they give you 12 widgets. So why don't you give them zero widgets? Well, that wouldn't be fair. Why didn't you give them 15? Well, you know, I'm, my mom's sick and I have to pick up uh, my dry cleaning. And you know, so the point is, it's not that people are, you know, ridiculously honest, they're not. People always shave around the edges. Not always, some people don't and some people cut right into the middle, but most people shave around the edges. And this is called, this is called, IK gave it the name, strong reciprocity. Meaning if you are good to me, I will return the goodness to you. Okay, so I knew, I think I understood immediately how deep this was. And, and how far it explains so many things that I understood about society that I never had understood. And so we set up a group, Sam Bowles and I set up a group uh, funded by the MacArthur Foundation of Chicago. They gave us millions of dollars and we, we used them well. I mean, we, we would have four meetings a year. We have 12 people that are they're now almost all of them are very well known for have Nobel prizes. Um, and we would talk and then we would do research. And um, it ended up with a tremendous, being a tremendous success. And I think the highest form right now is Dami, uh, is a five volume Oxford collection called Behavioral Economics, Sanji Dami, who's a wonderful person, very incredibly smart. And it's being used all over the place. And it can't help but change things. This one, there are more popular versions, by the way, I should say, if nudge, like the- um, uh, Yeah, hmm? Richard Thaler. Richard Thaler, yeah, and Cass Sunstein. Now it's all over the place because it does have, it does have real applications. Uh, but some of the, so that's what's been developing and it's been very successful. Um, it's not created, when I was at Harvard, even though I had a position there, the hostility level between me and, or us, uh, we so-called radical economists, and most of the faculty, oh, it was just terrible. I mean, I grew up learning that you hate your professors. I mean, you don't hate them, you love them, you think they're wonderful, but they're so they're so aboriginal, they would fit right into a chimpanzee cage without anyone even knowing. So we were always, in, always in fighting with them. But that doesn't, that's not true anymore at all. I mean, uh, the people do what they do and they respect each other. And again, as I say, people get Nobel prizes for doing behavioral economics. 
But, you know, I, that doesn't mean that I only do behavioral. One of the most, I think, important things I ever did was with a French economist proving the uh, stability of uh, Valrhasian general equilibrium. And we did that about five years ago. And, oh, this is such a sad story. I had been going, I had the idea of solving this problem for about 15 years. And every time I went out West, I would meet with Ken Arrow, who's the great general equilibrium theorist and the most wonderful person ever placed on this God's earth. I would talk to him about it. Um, so we worked, worked a long time on it. And when we finally solved it and got it published, you know, in the Journal of Mathematical Economics and a couple of other places. I, uh, I, put it, I put a chapter in my last book, Individuality and Entanglement, uh, which Arrow gave a uh, nice blurb on the back of the book. And one of the chapters was the proof of stability of general equilibrium. And he wrote me an incredible email saying, you know, how, how wonderful it was, you know, because he and Uzawa and Mackenzie and uh, Han and all sorts of the great they couldn't solve it. They couldn't solve it in 1950 because they didn't have game theory. It's very simple. They were trying to do something that was quite impossible to solve. The way they were trying to do it was quite impossible. So, but, and then, but, and I was so happy that I did that right before he died. It was about two months later that the Ken Arrow passed away. So, at any rate, you know, I'm not wedded to just doing behavioral. I'm not wedded to just doing mathematical equations. Uh, I have, I have a, 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 it was a lead article in current anthropology. Didn't have a single equation. In it. And, and with, it, it, there also were, it was, this is, I find very incredible. 10 people commented on this paper. It was a, it was a uh, what do you call it? A, I forget what they call it. A lead article and then other people comment on it. And I got, they got 10 anthropologists and nobody disagreed with it. I mean, they added to it, but I never had, I never heard of that before. You know, tearing the guy down is the, the way to go. Yeah, yeah, at any rate, so, you know, all sorts of things are happening. And what there needs to be more of is funding for transdisciplinary research on the level of training. So for instance, I mean, this is something I don't know a lot about, and I've never even been there. Arizona State, I think, yeah. reorganized. So yes, that yeah, yeah. Reorganized yes. around questions, not around disciplines. Yes, so here's my plan, okay? First year, first year, everybody learns the same stuff. Now that cuts a lot of people out. I know that cuts people out. For instance, I know people who are engineers, I know people who are brilliant anthropologists, but if you show them an equation, you have to take them quickly to the restroom. They just cannot handle an <laughs> equation. And I know people who cannot handle right. an idea. I, I mean, you know, engineering types that, well, put them in a sociology place, they're completely lost with all these ideas. So what I'm saying is real, that is they have to learn the math and they have to learn the ideas. And if they get through those two, then they go to the second year where they start to learn. And by the way, in the first year, they also learn scientific method and, and some history, stuff like that, that everybody can learn if they're a behavioral scientist. Next year, you study sociology or political science or uh, economics or uh, psychology or what have you, human, social psychology. I, mean, I don't think you need that for you know, cognitive psychology. Anyway, that's my vision, and it may happen, and maybe it's happening, you know? Yeah. It's a shame how little mathematics uh, humanity students are taught. I know you're working on a volume right now for math ah. for humanity students, yes? Uh, I'm not working very hard on it, I'll tell you that. I, sh I should be. I didn't know how to finish it. Yes, I wanted to write a book. I, so it's called Mathematics for Humanists, and I wrote it because... I remember the first instance I saw in the email, some guy said, well, people don't like math because they have to solve all those stupid problems. You know, they don't get the real deep stuff. And I wrote back, I said, well, I'm telling you what, I love those stupid problems. I, when I was eight, 10, 12, 14 years old, I worked on those stupid problems and I loved them. So it's not that, it's something else. 
but I didn't know what it was. So I thought, well, maybe it's that, maybe you can start with foundations and people will think that that is interesting and then they'll move on. For instance, and I haven't been working on it in a while, the um, uh, Skolum, one of Skolum's the famous theorems, which is every, every model has a counter, count, every theory has a counter, countative model. Skolum, something I, I, you know, Christ, I wrote a ton about it in my book. And you say, well, how is that? The reals aren't rational. The reals aren't countable. So how can you have a countable model of the reals? Right. I thought, well, that is interesting. Or people say that math is axiomatic, that it's just true. No, it's true. If you want real truth, look at math. They said, well, did you ever look at the disputes among mathematicians about the, about the um, uh, continuum hypothesis or you know, intuitionism? I myself was a very strong construction constructivist. Oh yeah, yeah. Constructivist means that you know it's not that you you deny contour and the other you know um, uh, set theorists. It's you say you what's really humans can do is set up models using letters and numbers. Now, any model that has letters and young numbers is countable because you can count the letters and you can count the numbers. So uh, accountability is really central there and um, it should affect everything. And I think it does. I try to do that in this book, but I haven't finished the book mostly because I never got up to calculus. <laughs> it is it's, it's thick, there's no calculus yet. But people should know how math is used and calculus is how math is used. And when I figured it out, but when I figured how to finish it was when I started, when I started studying a lot more physics. And I remember, and I, I, as I mentioned to you, I always start with foundation. So I went right back to Newton, you know, et cetera. Well, Newton proving Galileo's, I'm sorry, uh, Taco Brahe and, uh, What's his name? Uh, three laws. Come on, the uh, the solar the uh, three laws about the uh, rotation of the uh, planets around the sun. Kepler's laws. Kepler's laws. Okay. Uh, I was amazed at the beauty, the absolute stunning beauty of his work. Now he did it all without using calculus, although he knew calculus. You know, he invented it. So now I know how to get forward in that book, which is um, I'm gonna just I'm going to produce I'm going to culminate the book with enough physics so people can understand how he proved the three Kepler laws. And I thought if that doesn't do it, nothing will. I mean, in trying to say why math is important, but I don't know if I'll ever finish that book. I, I hope you do. <laughs> Be fun. I had great fun writing it. Yeah, it's great fun. Even pro proving the simplest things that you think of, like contours proof that if two, if two sets are equal potent, then they, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if there's, a, if, if there's an injection of one set into another and an injection of the second into the first, then um, they're equivalent in cardinality. I thought that was a brilliant proof too. Although I tried to, I tried to teach my son, who's basically a great a, a computer scientist and, and graphic artist. I tried to teach him the the method of um, uh, proving that uh, uh, the real numbers aren't countable, but he never accepted my proof. But I'd love to do it in my book. It was a great proof, you know. No, it's very exciting. It is very exciting. Um, you're shifting gears a little bit. I know you had a a theory for political or a a groundwork for political theory. The idea of thinking of political theory as uh, consideration of how rules of games change. Yes, that's right. How games change. Yes, but that's not how political theory has been developed. It's more, it's much more institutional. In fact, the best sociology. Now there's a lot of good sociology. 
is mid-range sociology. That is discussion of the hist of, of the nature of poverty and how it's changed or marriage and how it's changed. You know, common sense. You don't use any big theory there. And in, in um, so that's that's for sociology. But for political science, they don't use any big theory either. And they do really, I think their mid-range work is the best range, best by far. That is the study of particular political systems and how they evolve. Um, yeah, political science does have problem connecting theory compared to politics and, and international relations together. Though Those are very siloed off. Oh yeah. They haven't practice. run out of problems. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that again. Um, what's, what's your relationship with Marxism? None. I mean, I, I, I was a Marxist. I was, I studied, what I did is I was an undergraduate math major at the University of Pennsylvania. I was a graduate student in math at Harvard. I shifted from math to economics because I was very politically involved and I found the mathematics not politically involved and my teachers were they were only left-wing radicals they didn't teach us that anything so i shifted um and i had a good friend who's still chuck levenstein who was teaching at mit and he's i said what should i do i was at the time i was running a sandal shop in central square at harvard because I kind of dropped out. I mean, I was I didn't drop out, but I took a year off or two. And Chuck said to me, uh, well, are you a Marxist? I guess so. I mean, it's good to be, isn't it? You know, I didn't know anything about it really. He said, well, it's do economics, because Marx says economics determines us. So I said, what's economics? I didn't know what economics was. I knew my father hated income taxes. <laughs> That was as close as I got. So he said, well, go over and uh, read a couple of books. And I did, I read a couple of pop books. Okay, I'll do that. And one day I told my people I was working for at Harvard Square, said they were making bags at the time, so leather, neat leather bags, you know? I said, I'm gonna be gone for a couple of hours, just keep up and keep the shop up. And I, I walked over, it was about hundred degrees. I walked over to Litauer Center which is where the economics department was. And I went up to the fourth floor and it was complete, or I don't know, second floor, I don't know, remember. It was empty, except there was one guy in an office and I walked into his office. It said, Professor Duesenberg. And there was Professor Duesenberg in his office. And I said, Professor Duesenberg, I'm a graduate student in math and I passed my general's examinations. I'm writing my dissertation with uh, Professor Zariski on algebraic geometry, uh, but I wanted to do economics. So he talked to me about it for a while, and I won't go into details about this. And all of a sudden, I was an economics student. So that's how it happened that, I, that I'm an economist. Um, and for the first year, I wouldn't tell my friends that I was an economist. <laughs> I'm over there at Harvard. Yes. But I got to love it. You know, in fact, I got all A's my first year as a graduate student. My second year wasn't so successful because by the second year I understood economics and I didn't agree with the professors anymore all the time. So, um, you know, and there was a war going on and my professors were going over to Vietnam to advise the government on running this war. My PhD, my PhD supervisor was uh, a CIA employee i won't say agent but employee so you know i thought these guys are wrong about sex they're wrong about race they're wrong about gender they must be wrong about economics so i'll do marxist so i study marxist economics and sam bowles and i developed our own variant which was you know it wasn't we were always called um uh you know Innovators, I mean, the bad way is a bad word for it. I forget what it is. We always change things. But I'll tell you really why, what's wrong. First of all, Marx was not a good mathematician. And I really like good mathematicians. And I, I was a super Democrat. 
I mean, I'm still a super Democrat. I mean, I hate this count, the cancel culture and all this stuff, criticism of free speech and everything. It just viscerally nauseates me. Um, I believe in John Stuart Mill, and I love John Stuart. I did a chapter in my dissertation on John Stuart Mill. And on liberty, well, everybody's criticizing it nowadays, but I think it's one of the most brilliant pieces of work I've ever seen. And he is one of the most admirable men who ever lived. I mean, he was down, he got arrested for distributing birth control information in London slums. He had a long-term relationship with a woman and he, he was always, his whole life, a, a supreme feminist. Uh, so, but I still was a Marxist. But then one more thing happened. Um, the thing that happened was um, Amnesty International, International. And they were fighting for freedom for everybody, not just working class. And I thought, that's right, what are we doing? There's, there's, there's discrimination, there's gender. So I talked to Sam and we both agreed that, you know, Liberation isn't about the working class. Liberation is about liberation of peoples who are oppressed. And so gradually we weeded ourselves from Marxism. And moreover, I didn't think the working class was gonna go anywhere. This was a bunch of crap. I had a long talk with, uh, or a short talk, I had lunch with Herbert Marcuse once. I said, you guys, you Marxists, you think you got all the enlightenment and you're gonna get the working class to go make a revolution for you. And then you can teach them how to think. Well, it's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. You know, you're, that role is not a, a, the way to do anything. And so we didn't do that. We said, okay, we, we're into understanding society because we want to understand how to make a better society, a liberated society. And that's how I feel now. Probably people think I'm a conservative because uh, I don't accept can, can, cancel culture. And I don't like the 1619 project or whatever it's called. So um, I gave it up because it didn't explain what we needed to explain. And what it did explain, it didn't explain properly anywhere. There's no, there hasn't been a working class revolution anywhere. Not anywhere. There's all these, the Soviet Union is a pre, pre-industrial state. Uh, and China was a big agricultural state. So where's all this? Workplace. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it's almost it's also important to distinguish between Marx and Marxism, like Marxism in its political practice and historical context is a different thing from the corpus of Marxist work, which can be interesting research programs. Well, I think it is interesting, but I, I, I mean, look, if you want to study um, uh, a, a certain pr- a thinker from the past, take Hayek. Now, he, most we won't know Hayek. He won a Nobel Prize. He's a brilliant economist. Sam Bowles and I love Hayek. I learned incredible amounts from him. But he, you know, he was a fascist. He he believed that he didn't. He was he was anti-democratic. He believed in a republic, but he didn't believe in democracy. He said, for instance, he approved of the uh, uh, authoritarian takeover of um, Chile when it happened. And he wrote incessantly about the evils of the government, the state, big state, of, of the state at all. But we loved him. We just didn't thought he was wrong about that. So he's wrong about that. He wasn't wrong about anything else. Marx could be right about a lot of things, but, but wrong about some big things. And one of his big things is he certainly was not a Democrat. He, he had no sense. And his idea was San Simone and go right back to you know, direct democracy. What a bunch of crap. That's so false. Also, he was critical of Marcus. What's the matter with Marcus? You got some big thing about that? As soon as I realized that, we tried, Sam Bowles and I, we spent 10 years writing about worker owned firms and how you could replace capitalism with a, what they call um, democratic socialism where the workers own the firms. It's one year, Sam said to me, hey, you better study some capital theory. I don't know any, but you, you can do it and, I, and tell me what it says. I studied and I said, what it says is we're wrong. And we were wrong. The problem with worker-owned firms is that they can't, they can't finance themselves. 
because the people who are back of them can't provide collateral. So you're not going to get, you're, there'll be some, and there are some very successful worker owned firms, but very few, and, then, and they've been stable over time. So um, we had to develop an alternative theory. And as soon as you start to develop alternative theory, I said to myself, you'd better learn regular economics. I mean, of course, I was already past my exams and everything, but I didn't really learn it. You better really learn neoclassical economics. And I did. I spent a few years really learning it. Um, and then we used that to develop from. So my work is an extension of neoclassical economics. And my work is an extension of Marxian economics. And that's life, you know. Um, I've always been criticized for being heterodox. And I tell people, well, I'm not really heterodox, I'm really homodox. Meaning there's one truth and you go find it. Don't tell me about this, let a thousand blo blossoms, you know, flowers bloom. I wanna step on them if they're wrong. I don't, I don't have any sympathy for views that I disagree with unless I'm, I, if I'm sure I'm right. So uh, Marxism, the most important thing Marxism gave me was um, that you shouldn't do disciplines. Marx was not a disciplinarian, he was a philosopher. He studied economics and learned all these dumb equations, not well, but he did it. And that was the right thing to do. He just should have learned it better. He learned it in school, a little math in school. You know, one of the greatest physicists of all time, Michael Faraday, couldn't do an equation. He was poor, he was poor, so poor, he had no money never went to school, became an assistant to um, Thompson's lab, I think it was, uh, and was brilliant. And his work is brilliant. I mean, you read his work, it is brilliant, no matter. But um, I, I think that's a mistake, you know, because he's one person out of a thousand great physicists, and they all, uh, 9999, learn math. I am not, I'm not, as I, I mentioned before, I'm not a tolerant person when it comes to science. And if I think of you as wrong, I think it's wrong. I don't care whether the people in it are nice people that want to do good things. They're not going to do it if it's wrong. Get, at least start with understanding the world and then figure out how to intervene to make it a better place for people. Just don't create it out of your minds, you know. And, uh, I've looked for a long time, as I say, Sam and I spent many years trying to defend an alternative to capitalism called uh, workers' democracy and failed. I'm not very tolerant of people who don't, we I mean, are stuff, but it's got a lot of numbers in it or something, I don't know, a lot of math. But the, the problem is very simple and it should be understood that there's no alternative to a market economy, we know of, there's no, reasonable alternative to a market economy with an intervening state that corrects the failures of the market economy. And the intervening state does best if it's run democratically by the elected. That's a general state. Yeah, that's, that's a great formulation. Um, yeah. What, what is your advice for, for young people? Well, if you're starting right now, choose a field. It's most important and go to a place which is really strong in, um, in preparing you for being a, a contributor to that field. But also, if possible, find the place that has enough room for you to develop a more rounded possibility for understanding society. See if you can, if you can do both, that's great. Like for instance, I, I actually could do both because at Harvard, I could walk across the common and go talk to Jack Rawls or John Rawls or, or Nozick, or I could go to the sociology and talk to people. I did not talk to Parsons, but I did talk to others. It's nice if you're at a place where you can talk to other people and where the, uh, the staff and the professors are friendly and open-minded, but you don't go to a place just because it's interdisciplinary or something like that. You have to know a field really well in order to get around this world. And in fact, probably it may even be to do good work. 
it could be that if I hadn't studied economics and gotten a PhD in economics, which took you know years and years and years, I couldn't have done anything I did. Because from economics, I learned how to do math. I didn't learn how to do math in, math in my math department because we didn't abstract math. We didn't do, uh, we didn't do applied math. Um, so I felt that I could get a lot of resources while I am doing a very, uh, stand, in a way, a standard economics uh, uh, dissertation. The problem of being transdisciplinary is there's a lot of disciplines. And I, people think I'm, I'm uh, arrogant when I say this, but I can say that I, I know all those disciplines. Why do I know them? Because I'm 82 years old. I've studied them a lot. It's taken me many years to know. Uh, for instance, po population biology. Population biology is not trivial. It took me years to learn population biology. Um, three, about three years. But you have to learn them. You can't just superficially, you know, well, I read uh, Galbraith and now I know economics or something like that. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a very difficult road to hoe. Um, you have to become expert. Well, it helps if, you, if, you do, if you're very good at math because that'll carry you through a lot. It probably helps if you're very good uh, as a humanist, as you can write well. Uh, but I'm not sure about that. I don't know, that might not get you a job at all. I'm not sure. But you, you have to prepare to get a job, which means you have to do something better than everybody else who got there. Everybody who studied economics at some other institution and didn't learn all of the uh, Husserl and Kant that you did and doesn't know who Karl Marx is, they're competing against you who know all that stuff and took time out of learning what they know really well to do so. So you're at a disadvantage. And maybe that's the way it has to be in this world now. Or maybe it's best to do it that way, although it's very painful. Well, I can't say it was painful for me. I loved every minute of it, so I say. But I, I also found a dissertation advisor who, oh, I'm not, I can't even say, who was tolerant. In fact, he was so tolerant, I doubt that he ever read my PhD. He would just, you know, talk to me about it. And uh, it's a hard problem. But if you think that you're going to find some institution where they say, we're going to teach you, um, well, we're going to teach you to be uh, correct, not disciplinary. And you say, oh, well, I'll go and I'll tell everybody that. And they're going to love me for that. I'll go get a job for that. No way. I've found if I publish in a biology journal, if I use one word that sounds like it's economics rather than biology, the, the reviewers get pissed. They push their buttons. You can't, that term does not exist. You know? <laughs> so you have to be very careful in treading your way around. But that's not just now. That's been true of science from the very beginning. It doesn't do that. Yeah. I don't have any other thing. Don't don't do it if you're not don't think it's fun, and um, you should always combine fun with with work. But everybody knows that. Except when someone offers you a job that pays three times as much but isn't fun. 